our next speaker is Marcel Rico. He studied here in Graz and uh, he's now coming back here after he is at the London Air Ambulance and at the East Anglian Air Ambulance. And he will talk about the FAST protocol for detecting fluid in trauma patients. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Is that approximately the right spot to say? Um, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to the organization team. Um, they probably know that I'm quite a big fan of ultrasound and ultrasound examinations, um, and that's probably the reason why they invited me. Um, and I really would like to support this great event because I think you guys, you are the, the next doctors, you have to start early with ultrasound just to get the practice, and it will be the future um, of examinations, especially in the emergency departments, um, and probably also in the pre-hospital arena. I'd like to start with a case. Again? Okay, so um, these images have been taken from a job we went to about two or three weeks ago. Um, you can see that there's a car gone off the roads, through the bushes into a tree, probably very high speed. Police officers said it was about 50 to 60 miles an hour, that's 100 kilometers. If you look at the trace, that's, oops, this is where the car went off into the bushes and into the tree. I really can't believe this is only like 100 kilometers an hour. The, the guy was probably going much, much quicker than um, police thinks he has. Um, if you look at these images of the damages to the car, this is already after extrication. The patient was trapped for about 45 minutes before we arrived, and he was really heavily um, trapped in the car. You couldn't see anything below the pelvis, no legs, no, the pelvis itself was not identifiable. Um, the patient did not look very well. If you couldn't, we couldn't find any external hemorrhages, but he was very agitated. He was not able to communicate with us. He was just thrashing about, trying to pull off the oxygen mask, try to get out his um, IV lines, was not really responding to us. Um, he was very pale. He was very sweaty. Very obvious signs of shock. If he felt his pulse, very faint pulse, tachycardic, and also his respirate was very, very fast, probably about 40 or even higher than this. Um, and he also had some signs of cyanosis. So, if I, w I wanted to start, what do you think, what would be your main concern? Where do you think his agitation comes from? Or what kind of injuries were you suspecting, or would, would you suspect if you attend um, this patient? Could he have a head injury? Yes, so that could be one reason why he could be very agitated, obviously. What are other reasons to be not responding well in, in such a setting? Is there anything else? Loss of blood, yes, shock. If there is no blood going to the brain anymore, you're getting crazy, you will not be able to, to act normally, you will not be able to respond. And actually, being agitated, being not very responsive is normally the first sign of, of quite a severe shock. What else could cause agitation and uh, lowering in the GCS? So what, what is the blood transporting to the, towards the brain? Oxygen. So if you have a tension pneumothorax, if the lungs are collapsed, if you have a flail chest and you cannot ventilate properly, um, that, could cause, that could cause hypoxia, which also causes the agitation, which we could see in patients like this. But what else would you think about? So we have said blood of blood. So where can you lose the blood? Where do you think could be the reason for this guy's shock? Pelvis, yes. What else? In the, into the abdomen, bleeding into the abdomen, yes. Is there any other organ which could be in danger of causing a shock? Especially, it's really hard to see on these slides, but if you look at the steering wheel, it's really bent. Even the, um, the steering column is bent, which indicates that the chest hit very hardly, hit the steering wheel, and there is no deployment of, um, of the airbag either. So what could this... Chest injuries, yes. 
pericardium. So you could potentially have a ruptured atrium or even a ruptured aorta, and this could cause a um, pericardial tamponade, which is also causing shock. So you have really quite a lot of reasons why this patient, where this patient could be injured in causing his symptoms, and you're the ones to find where these um, where these injuries are. And you can have the settings inside the hospital, if you are the receiving hospital and you're the trauma team leader or part of the uh, trauma team member, and you have to try um, to find which region of the body is causing all of the symptoms, this would be a very good start to use the FAST exam because it will help you to identify the different um, parts and injuries which are causing the shock. Um, I use the term EFAST because I think that's nowadays the, the term and the examination which probably every one of you would use in the future. Um, the, just the team of Sona for you asked me um, to talk about EFAST, our FAST exam on its own. EFAST was intr uh, introduced a couple of years later, maybe four or five years later after the original FAST exam. And the, the FAST exam itself was only for the abdomen and a view to the heart. The EFAST stands for extended fast, which includes the chest and the special pneumothoraces. But these are covered tomorrow, I think. Um, the chest is very, um, well, it's explained tomorrow in other talks, and that's why I'm focusing on the fa FAST exam. So what is FAST? The FAST exam is just because it's a very, very fast examination with the ultrasound. Um, I guess probably it is, so they use the acronym and try to find wordings for it. Um, but it, what, it, what it actually stands for is the Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma, or Focused Assessment for sonoc uh, with Sonography in Trauma. And it pretty much tells you everything you want to know for it. You, you take an ultrasound probe and you have a very focused f um, view on possible sites of injuries to identify them and um, find the, 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 dif the differential diagnosis, especially in trauma patients for the, sock, uh, for the shock, as quickly as possible. Yeah, you know, what does the FAST exam give you? That's really important to understand. Um, first of all, it will tell you if there is an intraperitoneal free fluid. And it's very important to understand that it actually only gives you the information that there is free fluid and not necessarily blood. Obviously, if you use the exam during a trauma um, assessment, it is most likely to be blood, but that could be already some misleading cause if you have an ascites, if you have a predisposed disease like a liver disease, or for example, a pregnant females can have sl uh, small amounts of free fluid in their uh, peritoneal region. Um, so y these are pitfalls you have to know, but most likely the intraperitoneal free fluid is actually blood. And it's also important that it's mainly for the peritoneal area, so intraperitoneal. FAST exam is not very good to identify bleedings into the re in, in the retroperitoneal um, space. And there are quite some significant organs causing a lot of bleeding. If you think about falls from heights, the kidneys normally keep with a, their mass going downwards and rupture with their, and their renal arteries. This is a, a very typical cause of, of retroperitoneal significant bleeding um, in trauma patients. Um, or the pelvic injuries, where you have a lot of bleedings in the pelvis, that's also all retroperitoneal area. You will probably not be very likely to get, catch them with the ultrasound examination and the FAST examination. What else can you look for FAST? You're looking for pericardial fluid collections. Um, obviously, normally you do have some small amounts of blood around the heart, so they can like move very easily within the pericardial sac. But you are looking for, for bigger collections of blood. Although you have to be aware that if someone has a trauma and there's bleeding going into the pericardial region, um, it does not have to be a, a very significant amount because the pericardial sac has not adapted to the fluid collection. So even a small amount of blood, like maybe 100, 200 mils of blood, could already cause tamponade in these patients. If you look Cancer patients who have normal pericardial effusion during, um, because of their treatment, um, they can have quite a significant amount of fluid and do not have a pericardial tamponade because the pericardial sac just increases in size and gives space to the fluid. And these patients can cope with a lot of fluid quite well, actually. What else can you see? You can see if you have intra um, pluri fluid collections. 
because you're looking at the left and the right upper quadrant, you just you are at the border of the diaphragm and at the ab abdominal regions. If you look a little bit higher up, you have a good view to the chest cavity and you can see if you have fluid collections on that side. And then obviously there's the pneumothorax, um, but this is covered by the EFAST exam and will be covered tomorrow in the other talks. Because for the pneumothorax, you probably would like to see, oh, uh, you wouldn't scan on the top part of the chest. Air tends to go upwards when, you, when the patient is supine. Um, and that's where you want to look for the, the signs of the pneumothorax. So why would you do a, th um, a FAST exam in the hospital as a trauma team? Well, first of all, it gives you the data of differential diagnosis, differential diagnosis of shock, and it could tell the surgeon where to cut into. So if you have a shocked patient, and you go through all the assessments, we have discussed a few areas where the patient could bleed. You could tell him either to go uh, for a laparotomy if there's free fluid in the abdomen, or you could tell him you rather make a clamshell um, thoracotomy to get rid of the blood clot in the, in the heart, or maybe just a thoracostomy is good enough to, to release the tension pneumothorax. But all these simple examinations, the, the, the very simple examination with the ultrasound can give you all of these informations. Um, and also the surgeon where to go to, especially if they are shocked and you want to go, with, uh, go on with the treatment right away. If the patient is not shocked, if the patient is stable, you might still want to go to CT scanner um, because it's the more definitive assessment of the patient itself. So why would you use ultrasound or fast in the, in the resource room if if you have a CT scanner available. Well, if you have a CT scanner like this, this is, pro I think, in Frankfurt, um, they have a CT scanner where the patient in the resource room will be placed directly onto the um, CT scanner itself for its assessment. And after they have checked the airway, they will do the scan right away. So approximately two, three minutes after arrival, the patient will have his CT scanner ready. Um, so in these circumstances, it's pro uh, circumstances is probably very unlikely that patients will need a fast examination because they get the definitive diagnosis much, much quicker. Although you have to think about the radiation caused by a CT scan, especially by these very thin sliced pan CT scans, they are quite significant. And there are also studies showing that um, there's a very increased risk in developing cancer further on down the life. If you have uh, a pan CT scan for a polytrauma. So you have to be aware of that. And if you don't think it's absolutely necessary, then you might not want to do it and use the ultrasound, for example, again. Um, but you shouldn't really see the FAST exam in competition with, um, with the CT scanner. It has just different indications. If you want to be very exact, that's when you go for the CT scanner. If you need to be very quick to make a decision if the patient needs to go surgery, um, then you probably will just use the ultrasound. They just work together. And then if you look, our hospital, or this hospital here is quite good. The CT scanner is not very far away from, um, from the trauma resource room. That's just around the corner and about 10 meters away. But there are other hospitals where you have to walk along alleys, maybe go even the second, uh, to a different floor to the CT scanner. And then it, the more, um, or the further away the CT scanner is from the resource room, the more likely and the more happy you will be that you have an ultrasound machine to assess the patient. And obviously, the pre-hospital arena. Nowadays, ultrasound machines are getting more and more compact, very easy to carry around. Um, so I think this will be a big part in the future to assess patients. You don't want to waste time with it, but you will find your slots um, where you can do assessment and use the ultrasound. Especially in this, in this case, if you want to listen to the chest to figure out if the patient has a pneumothorax, I mean, medical school and, and the training normally tells you to assess for pneumothorax. What are the typical signs for pneumothorax? Or especially tension pneumothorax? So obviously you have to assess the chest itself. If you have rib fractures, if you have a flail chest, that's already quite a significant indication that there's probably something wrong underneath as well. But then you're supposed to listen. If you imagine like 10 firemen around there with the big um, machinery trying to cut the, the, the car part, 
there's no way that you actually will be able to, to listen to anything in the chest. Then the patient is groaning and moaning and making noises, so really hard to listen with your stethoscope and find out if there is a difference in the um, ventilation on each side of the chest. Um, but with the ultrasound, very easy actually to assess and figure out on which, size, uh, on which side you have pneumothorax or not. Are there any questions so far? Not really. Okay, so now I would like to go on with the, with the talk and go through the different views and how to get to the view you want. Um, first of all, you have to select the right probe. Obviously, you have an ultrasound machine. Doesn't matter if it's that size over there or if the small portable ones, whatever you want, but you have to select the right probe. And Simon went through all of them yesterday, as far as I've seen online. Um, this is the curved linear one, and that's probably the one, if you have to choose one for the fast exam, that's probably the one you want to have. Um, that's the abdominal um, probe, ultrasound probe normally. So obviously you want to start to have a look at the abdomen, but you can also have a very good view to the pericardial window from the subxiphoid view. Um, you, you can use this probe quite well as well to assess uh, for pneumothoraces. Um, so this would be probably the probe for the FAST exam. Um, the phased array, the one you normally use for the cardiac exam, can be a multi-purpose multi exam probe. So in many cases, you have an ultrasound machine where you use the cardiac probe for abdomen, um, abdominal scanning as well. Um, so this would work quite well for most of the FAST exam as well. What's really tricky with it is to look for pneumothoraces with this because it's very pointy at the, at the, big, um, at the initial part of the scan, and that's where you want to look for the plural um, sliding signs, and that's really hard to identify with this probe. And then you have the linear probe, the linear probe is very high frequency, very high resolution, but does not go very deep into the tissue, so you will not be able to see anything quite close underneath the skin. This is the, the, the best probe to look for pneumothoraces, but you can't use it for anything else for the FAST exam. So if you have to choose quickly, go for the abdomen type um, probe, and you can do pretty much the whole examination with this um, with this probe. Also, as a repetition, what kind of images you get. Um, you get slice images, slice images like you get with the CT, um, through the, the region you scan, so what you need, to, you, you, you need to know your anatomy, you need to know the region you are looking for, and you need to know what you're looking for. Um, but that's why you have to train it and use the ultrasound as much as possible to figure it out. Um, and the good thing about the ultrasound is you're not kind of bound to the standard slicing, what you have in CT scanners, and from up and down you can t twist it, turn it, push it up and down. Um, so if you think you can see something not in the standard view, you still can use it and figure out if there's something going on underneath there. And this is also as a repetition. Fluid normally shows up as a black hypoechoic structure. It's black because it transmits the ultrasound beam very, very well. They get it just go through it. They will not be reflected, and that's why they don't show up on the computer screen. Um, air and strong borders like the pericardium or the peritoneum or the diaph diaphragm, they reflect the ultrasound beams very well, and they show up as very bright, hyperechoic structures um, on the ultrasound. So this is what you're looking for if you're looking, uh, especially for borders, and then. You have the viscera in between, they just show up at different grayscales in the abdomen, but you get used to it once you use the ultrasound quite a lot. Yep, and this is um, just a slide to show you the, the typical positions. Is that possible that you can make it a little bit darker, the screen? The, a little bit, um, close the shades a little bit so that I think the view is not... Or are you okay with... With the screen, okay. Um, so the four main windows you're looking for, that's the right upper quadrant, the subxiphoid view, left upper quadrant, and the superpubic regions. For the superpubic region, you have two cuts normally. You have a longitudinal view and a transverse view. Some people 
put numbers to these um, specific windows. I don't think that's actually a good idea because normally you assess the patient first, you have a clinical examination, you look at the patient, and most of the time you actually have already quite a good idea where the potential injury is. So if you want to be really focused, you probably choose that position um, first where you want to, to look, uh, where you look for. So if you have a uh, left-sided side impact on the patient, it's more likely that there are rib fractures, the spleen is just underneath the ribs, so that's probably quite likely that someone has a bleed underneath the spleen, so you might want to start there. Um, if you have an impact onto the, onto the sternum, like with this chap on the, on the images before, it's more likely that you have a pericardial effusion and you want to look at the heart first. So no matter which, which one you start, you should go through all of them, and I don't think um, they need to be numbered in a certain direction. I would like to start with the right upper quadrant. The right upper quadrant, the reason for this is mainly because that's the region in, in the peritoneum where you're most likely to find the first collection of blood or free fluid. Um, so what you want to do is you want to put the probe in the mid-axillary, maybe posterior axillary line on the right side of the patient's chest, probably at the level just below the sternum, the sternum go to the mid-axillary line or the posterior line that's between the seventh and the ninth rib, um, point the marker dot to the, to the patient head, so point upwards, and then you have to twist and turn to get the best, um, best window in between the ribs to get no reflections or rib shutters which obstruct your view. This is just an animation a picture of an animation, I will show the whole video a little bit later on, um, what you actually want to see. So you have your probe up here, that the beam goes through the liver initially, right after the skin, and then you should try to get the whole length of the kidney afterwards, um, and you're looking for Morrison's pouch, which is just the, um, the recess of the, the peritoneum in between the, the liver and the kidney. Um, Here's a scan of the abdomen. Um, do you mind if I just step over there? <laughs> oh, it does not work. Um, if you want, I can give you a, uh, there's a really nice homepage with three CT scans, and you can like scan through the whole area and have a much better look to get an um, understanding of the anatomy, which really helps a lot, but this, this works well as well. So again, this is a transverse section in the CT scan. You have the liver up here and then you have the kidney, and you put the probe on the right side of the chest and just scan and fan the whole area so that you cover the whole Morrison's pouch, which is this small gap in between kidney and, and, uh, and liver, and look for free fluid there. And this is the, the coronal view um, in the CT scanner, and that's exactly the image you're looking for. So your probe is on that side, and this is pretty much yeah, the image you get on the ultrasound and what you should get. So next thing, this is the video uh, from Sonocyte. They're also um, openly available, either on the homepage of Sonocyte or on, in YouTube, and they're very well done. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the right upper quadrant view of the FAST exam. The orientation marker is directed toward the patient's head. The transducer is placed in a long axis orientation along the right mid-axillary line between the 7th to 9th intercostal space. Rotation and oblique positioning of the transducer will help eliminate rib shadows. To evaluate the entire area of the hepatorenal recess for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an anterior to posterior position. If present, fluid will appear as a dark or anechoic stripe between the kidney and the liver. If it is difficult to visualize the hepatorenal recess, a deep inspiration will move the diaphragm and other structures in this area down and below the ribs for easier access. Sliding the transducer upward will visualize the diaphragm and pleural interface. Sliding the transducer downward will visualize the inferior pole of the right kidney. Okay, there are a few points which I want to make. If you look at these, um, you will see a lot of normal examinations the next couple of days when you exercise these views. Um, 
So I will show you some images of, of positive fast exams, so of collections of free fluid. But you, what you have to be aware of, you have to look for pointy, irregular structures of free fluid, because obviously um, in the abdomen and in the organs you will find also fluid structures, fluid field structures like vessels, especially in the liver, um, the sinoids, and also the other villa, uh, um, liver vessels itself. They have a, a hypoechoic structure and could look a, like a, a fluid collection, but they're just normal um, and shouldn't be falsely interpreted as, as uh, free interperitoneal fluid. Um, and the other thing is what is really important is not only to scan like from, from the anterior to the posterior um, region, it's really also very important to um, go up level higher to get the area just around um, underneath the diaphragm and also a little bit further down distals to see if there is some fluid collection at the tip of the, of the liver. Um, I can't show it here now. That's the first image. Unfortunately, I think, I hope you can see everything what you need. Um, these images are from, from sonoguide.com. There's also a very good um, homepage to go through and, and look through um, for tips and tricks um, in, in everything um, connected to, to Sono ultrasound, um, but also the FAST exam. So what you can see here, that upper structure here, that's the white structure, hyperechoic structure is the last part of the diaphragm. diaphragm. This gray scaled organ is the, the liver. Then you have the very typical structure of the kidney where you have like hyperechoic or darker gray structure around it and the pelvis in the middle and it looks like they covered the whole length of the kidney. And then this pointy irregular structure around the liver um, and in the recess that's free fluid. That's what you're looking for. Um, this is actually already quite a significant amount, um, quite obvious to see. So this is a very positive examination of the fast. This is uh, another point. This is the one where I said you should move a little bit further down, downwards towards the feet, because you want to cover, oop, you want to cover the tip of the um, uh, of the the liver, because that's the area where some fluid collection could happen as well. If you look at the to Morrison's pouch, there's very very tiny bit in here. Um, so if you just look at the um, other, the, or just use the standard view of the fast exam, you might miss the big fluid collection at the tip of the liver. So you always scan up and down and try to get the whole region. Um, and in here, you can see these structures inside the liver. That's not lacerations, that's just general big vessels inside the liver, so this is completely normal. That's the free fluid collection. And this is the other side of the liver I was pointing out. So the white big bright structure next to the liver is the diaphragm, then you have the, the liver again, and down here you have the kidneys. And this is a very quite significant amount um, of fluid collection above the, 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 the liver in the subdiaphragmatic space. And potentially, hard to say from here, from the, from the still image, there's also some fluid collections in the chest cavity as well. So that's the free fluid. And this is the chef chest cavity itself. Again, bright white structure, the diaphragm underneath the, kid uh, the liver. And then you have a big fluid collection inside the chest. Normally you wouldn't see anything there because you have the lung overlying it and you cannot scan through the lung. The only thing you would see is right at the top of the image, some pleural sliding, and then everything underneath, should, you shouldn't see anything there if there's a normal uh, configuration. What do you think this gray structure here is? Yes, collapsed lung. Could potentially be some blood clot as well. That's again really hard to say in the fixed image. But if you scan up and down, you probably will see the, the, the lung moving in the, in the fluid, swimming in the fluid. So it, it is most likely to be lung. Um, yeah, and again, free fluid everywhere in the chest cavity. So this is an indication this patient has mainly a hemothorax and probably needs a thoracotomy or um, a th thoracic surgery rather than an abdominal surgery. Next one is the left upper quadrant. So the left upper quadrant should be just opposite of the right upper quadrant, but what you need to do to get a really good view, and that's what you have to like exercise next couple of days, um, you have to move a little bit more cranial, so you, 
try to get the probe a little bit more um, upwards to the, to, the, to the head, much more posterior. So on the left side, you're very likely to hit the, um, the trolley with your knuckles. So really place the ultrasound probe and your hand on, on the knuckles, really uh, on the trolley, really push it down inwards. And then you're more likely to put um, the, um, or direct the probe towards the pelvis um, to uh, um, be try to avoid the rib shadows if you want to get the view right. Um, you also have probably have to twist the, the probe a little bit into the direction of the ribs. They are not straight up here, they have an um, oblique direction and you really have to play around to get the probe into the right direction until you get the right view for it. As you can see here, that's much more posterior and higher up. And then you can, s on this image, you, it's indicated that the probe is a little bit po pointed towards the pelvis and rotated so that you can avoid the ribs and get a good view um, of the left upper quadrant. Something really important to point out as well, as we see, look at the anat anatomy again. So this is where you put the probe. This is what you want to scan. The kidney, spleen, that's the... Recess, a recess in between the kidney and the spleen. So this is potentially um, an area where you can have fluid collection. But the, kid, uh, the spleen itself is much more uh, surrounded by a peritoneum and is more likely to have blood all around the, the spleen if there's a lot of blood. You could potentially see some intracapsular blood as well. So if you have a big l laceration um, of the spleen, you could s probably find the fluid collection within this, the structure, which is a good indication that the patient maybe, not, uh, maybe will not need a surgery because you can try to contain the blood within it. But you can do serial ultrasound examination to figure out um, when the blood is actually spreading in the abdomen as well. Uh, and that's the animation again. A phased array know. transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the left upper quadrant view of the FAST exam. The orientation marker is directed toward the patient's head. The transducer is placed in a long axis orientation along the left posterior axillary line between the fifth to seventh intercostal spaces. The sonographer's hand will touch the gurney with the proper transducer position. Rotation and oblique positioning of the transducer will help eliminate rib shadows. To evaluate the entire area of the spleenorenal recess for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an anterior to posterior position. Carefully examine the spleenorenal recess and subphrenic space. Fluid will appear dark or anechoic. If it is difficult to visualize the spleenorenal recess, a deep inspiration will move the diaphragm and other structures in this area down and below the ribs for easier access. Sliding the transducer in an upward direction will visualize the diaphragm and pleural interface. This is actually a really good um, tip. Um, if the patient is compliant, ask him to take a deep in. Um, inspiration because that will push the diaphragm and also the intra-abdominal organs further downwards and it's much easier to, f to see the, or the organs in that view. The problem is um, if the patient is really sick it's very unlikely that he's compliant enough and if he has rib fractures it's also very unlikely that we will be able to do a deep breath. Uh, another really important thing to understand with fast examination it gives you um, a good indication of free fluid in the, in the peritoneal cavity but it does not give a good examination of the organs itself. You can find big lacerations quite easily. Um, some, some of the minor lacerations you will be able to find with specific um, examinations if you love uh, contrast media. Um, but otherwise, to examine the organs, fast exam is probably not, not the right, um, right examination to do. So this is where you need the CT scanner again. Um, especially if you want to look at damages to the bowels. If there's a rupture in the bowels, you will not be able to de detect this um, with the ultrasound. I mean, there's probably, it's qu probably quite likely that there's a lot of air in the peritoneal region and you will not see a, lo um, a lot at all. And that gives you an indication that there's probably a perforation of the bowels, but that's definitely not a definitive diagnosis and also not where it's, where it's coming from. Again, now some images of a positive FAST exam. 
Um, on this image, you are missing actually the kidney, but what you can see very well is, is the, the spleen, and the spleen is surrounded by an unechoic or hyperechoic structure. Um, and like I said before, it's very likely if a lot of blood is coming out that this is surrounding the, the, the spleen and not only in between the recess of, of kidney and spleen. This again is the diaphragm, and up here that would be the intrathoracic cavity to look for fluid up there as well. Okay, fluid surrounding the spleen, that's a very obvious positive exam. Um, unfortunately, it's not always that easy to identify. That's, uh, again, a little bit a small amount of blood um, around the, the, the spleen. So you have the tip of the spleen up here, and the blood goes around the tip. Kidney is down here. That's probably some, some fat of the um, kidney that's surrounding the kidney, and the blood reaches down into this recess Again, a positive fast exam on that side. Yeah, and this is a very obvious positive fast exam, like the other one before. The spleen is swimming in free fluid. This patient definitely needs surgery. I'm not sure if they have to take out the spleen, but definitely laparotomy to assess what's going in, into, in the abdomen. Now the subxyphoid view. The subxyphoid view is, is the view you can use Pretty much everyone. I, I would, if you want to get one view really well, this is probably the one you want to train the most because you can have a very good view to the heart. This is not only very important in, in the fast examination, it will give a very good indication in cardiac arrests. So if you want to have a look at the heart, what the heart is doing during cardiac arrests, that's the view, the view you want to use because you can keep going with the chest compressions next to it. Um, normally, it's the best view if, if the patient is supine. So if you do the, the other um, views or windows with, um, with the cardiac examination, you normally want the patient on his left side so that the heart is falling towards the chest. But if you have an unconscious patient who is lying on his back, that's probably the best, the best um, window to get a really good view of the heart. Again, intensive care unit. No, no, no. So this is, the, this is really the view you want to learn very well. It gives you a very good indication um, what's going on within the pericardium, but also with the heart itself. Yeah, you can play around a lot to get a lot of information from that view. So there are a few tricks to get a very good view of that region. Obviously, there's an organ underneath the skin in between the heart, which can obstruct your view quite badly, and that's the stomach with a lot of air in it. So especially after lunch, when you do your um, views after lunch, it might, might be hard to get a view of the heart from this position. Um, you, want to can, you can try to squeeze it out, or what else? Um, there's the other trick would be to move the, the probe a little bit further to the right and use the liver as a window, an acoustic window, to look for the heart. So if you can't get the view right, in the middle of the, of the abdomen, move it a little bit towards the right, catch the liver, and then point upwards to the left chest um, to find the heart. The other really important thing is you really have to push down. You have to get underneath the, the ribs, and you have to really change the position how the, how the, in the way you hold the probe. So normally you have the probe um, from underneath, but in this specific view, you probably want to hold the probe from the top and really squeeze down. If you look at the lecture from, from Cliff Reed uh, on fast examination, he has a very good discrimination, uh, uh, explanation how he um, s teaches people to get this view. So if you want to, you, you have to think that you want to eat the, the, the patient's heart with a spoon through the subxyphoid view. So you really have to dig in through the skin, go through the diaphragm and spoon out the heart. It's very imaginary, but it's very good to remember what you want to do with the probe. That's exactly the movement you want. Just press it in, go very flat, and point towards the right, uh, the left chest. This image, you can actually see how you have to like flatten the probe, because this is the area I want to go through. Just underneath the skin is the heart. You can actually feel the, the apex of the heart, so that's very superficial, that's where you want to point, it, point the, the marker dot to, or the probe towards to. Um, and this image shows very well that you can use the liver as an acoustic window. If the, if the stomach is in the way and you have a lot of air in the, in the fundus, it's really hard to see anything up in the chest. So you want to use the liver to get a good view of 
of the chest cavity or of the a heart. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the subxiphoid or subcostal view of the heart in the FAST exam. Place the transducer in the subxiphoid position with the orientation marker to the patient's right side at a 9 o'clock position. This view uses the liver as an acoustic window to visualize the four chambers of the heart. Aim the transducer slightly toward the left shoulder at a 15 degree angle to the chest wall. In some cases, the transducer is almost flat to the abdominal wall, so the ultrasound beam is directed toward the left chest cavity. A considerable amount of ultrasound gel and downward pressure may be needed to maintain contact of the transducer face with the abdominal wall. Increase scanning depth to visualize all chambers of the heart. The first structure seen closest to the transducer is the liver. The right side of the heart will appear closer to the transducer than the left side of the heart on the ultrasound image. The myocardium will appear gray and the blood-filled chambers will appear hypoechoic. The bright white pericardium is seen surrounding the heart adjacent to the gray myocardium. Evaluate the function of all chambers. Compare the size of the right and left ventricular cavities. Note any wall motion abnormality and the presence or absence of pericardial effusion. So again, for the FAST exam, we pretty much only want to know if there's a pericardial tamponade, but like it's indicated in this video, um, you can get much more information out of that, um, out of that view as well. I mean, if you, if you think about the patients who are elderly, they maybe have quite a significant dysfunction of the left ventricle, which could be part of shock as well. Um, could actually indicate the medical reason for the shock rather than trauma. Um, they could have had a heart attack before they had the trauma. This, um, this is a very good view to evaluate the heart and its functions. So these are different loops from, um, from views with pericardial effusion and pericardial tamponade. Not all of them are from the subxiphoid view, so this, this one up here and this one down here, they're in the parasternal long axis, but it still gives you a good indication of what you're looking for. So you have the pericardial sac with a very bright structure around the heart. That's pretty much in all of the images. And then you have the heart with its ventricles, and then you have the anechoic fluid surrounding the heart. And especially, this is a very typical view of the subxiphoid view. And what you can see very well up here is actually that the white right ventricle is forming a like curvature in, in the diastolic phase, which indicates pericardial tamponade. So like I said before, people who are used to pericardial effusion, long-lasting or long time to develop a, a pericardial effusion, might not develop a pericardial tamponade. Whereas trauma patients, they might not need a lot of fluid before the tamponade actually starts to happen because the pericardial sac does not expand. So this is a very po important information if you want to decide if the patient needs urgent um, release of that fluid ins inside the, the chest or the, the pericardium. This is the swinging heart, this one as well. This is a very typical, I mean, it's quite obvious what it looks like. The heart swings around in the per pericardial sac. There's one important thing, especially if you use the parasternal view, um, the pericardial effusion could uh, accidentally be mistaken with the pleural effusion because the pleura is just behind the pericardium on that side, on that view. But you could use the aorta, so this is the descending aorta, the round structure here, as the, the marker to indicate where the blood is going. So if the, the fluid stops before the, the aorta, then that's definitely pericardial effusion. If the fluid goes behind and around the aorta, then that's pleural effusion. So that's the right, just to figure out what the right cavity is you want to go for. Yeah, the last view is the suprapubic view. Like I said, you just want to place the probe um, in the suprapubic region, the marker dot initially, if you want to do the transverse view first, um, pointing to the patient right again. Um, you can also do the longitudinal view first, and the marker dot will need to point to the patient's head. Um, this is the animation or the picture of the animation, what you're going for. Just below the skin, you should see the bladder. The bladder is very, it's very helpful if the bladder is fluid filled, because that gives you a very good window behind the bladder, and that's the region you want to look for. 
Obviously, the, that's a female, a female pelvis with the uterus in, be in between um, the rectum and the, um, the bladder. And turn, there's the anatomical image. Again, this is the bladder, uterus, and that's the D Douglas, the pouch of Douglas. That's quite obvious why the fluid would collect or start collecting in this rare area. In the male, you just have to look for the, for the bladder and the area behind the bladder and look for free fluid in this region. Um, if there's a lot of free fluid, it will surround the whole bowels. It's very easy to see the whole intestine swimming in free fluid. Um, yeah, it's probably one of the easiest views, although um, one thing you have to be aware of, if, you have, if you're using the ultrasound probe from the other views first, um, the good transmission of the ultrasound beams through the bladder will give you a very bright, probably overgained area just behind the bladder because it's very easy for the beams to go through the bladder. Um, and because of this overgaining, there is a potential that you miss small amounts of blood behind, um, behind the bladder, which again, probably is not a reason for shock. And you're mainly interested if the patient sick and has free fluid because otherwise you would do a CT scan anyways. Okay, that's the video again from Sonocyte. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the pelvis view of the FAST exam. Place the transducer in a transverse position with the orientation marker to the right at the level of the symphysis pubis. The pelvis is evaluated in two planes. It is easier to perform this exam when the bladder is filled. The bladder is used as an acoustic window to view the cul-de-sac or retrovesicular space for free fluid. To visualize the bladder, angle the transducer inferiorly into the pelvis. If it is difficult to visualize the bladder, slide to the left or right of the symphysis pubis to bring the bladder into view. To evaluate the pelvis for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an inferior to superior position. Fluid will appear hypoechoic or anechoic and accumulate posterior to the bladder, posterior to the uterus, and between loops of bowel. To obtain a long axis view, rotate the transducer 90 degrees with the orientation marker pointed toward the patient's head. Sweep the transducer across the pelvis from left to right to evaluate the pelvis for free fluid. Okay, and now again, some images of a positive FAST exam. Um, again, this up here is the bladder, down here is the uterus, and then you can see some minor collection of free fluid around there. As you can see, the whole area is very bright and hyperechoic. This is what I mean, because of the overgaining through the, the, the bladder, this is why everything is bright white afterwards and could um, like prevent you finding the small amount of fluid. Um, just behind the bladder. That's a very obvious finding of free fluid. You can see the free, free fluid collection pretty much everywhere outside the bladder. The uterus up here and the pouch of Douglas down there. Fluid is everywhere, so this patient is probably quite shocked. Um, this is probably also the first uh, finding if you have an extra u um, uterine uh, um, pregnancy because the, the blood will just bleed out in this region of the pelvis first before it spreads somewhere else. So how good is FAST? Um, FAST is around now for quite a bit, and obviously there have been a lot of studies done during um, the last 10 years, and as always, there are people more prone to use ultrasound, there are more like, like to use ultrasound than people who don't like this examination. And then you have stu um, studies showing sensitivity of low as 42, but if you average them out, um, it's probably sensitivity between 75 and 100%. So that's the overall, if you take the, the studies from, that's from trauma.org, but you can have a lot of um, multi um, studies, uh, multi, oh, I forgot the name now, um, a lot of studies combined together. What's always good is the specificity, uh, specificity of 98%, probably eher 95%. Um, but what's really important that if you have a sick patient, a, a shocked patient, systolic blood pressure below 90, you get very sensitive. So even if 
if you're not very well trained um, and you're starting to use the ultrasound, you probably will be able to identify the cause of bleeding or the region of bleeding in a, in a, in a shocked patient, and that's where you want to look for. Um, also, the specificity is actually going a little bit down, but this, the reason is normally they measure it against the need for laparotomy, so potentially, if there is quite a, a significant amount of free fluid, the patient went to surgery and actually did not need it in the end because they didn't do anything or took, take anything out like the spleen. So this is why the spleen, uh, the spleen spe uh, specificity goes actually a little bit down rather than up. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a FAST? Because we want to use it together with every, every f and diagnostic tool we have, like CT scan or your um, experience and examination as well. Obviously, it's quite a rapid examination. If you get used to it, you can go through the four windows quite quickly. Um, ultrasound machines are getting more and more portable. You can take them pretty much everywhere. Even these towers um, are quite portable. It's obviously quite safe and non-invasive, so you can do it multiple times on patients repetitively um, because you will not cause any harm. Most of the time it, time, it does not even hurt the patient very much, so that's actually a very good training tool. Even if, if you're out in a rotation, just grab the machine, ask the patient if, if they're all right um, to have a look at the, uh, with the ultrasound, just have a go with it. Um, most patients will be happy to, to assist you with this um, teaching experience or learning experience. Um, obviously, low sensitivity is in, ma in many studies, but a very high se uh, sensitivity in shocked patients um, and always a quite high specificity. Um, yeah, disadvantages, obviously, potentially, even if you use it in the, in the early phases of the pre-hospital arena or pre-hospital setting, you might be actually too early to find the intraperitoneal fluid because it still needs some, some ongoing bleeding to, to see the free fluid. It will, you will start to see free fluid above 100, but there, you have to be quite good with, to see 100 mils. It's probably more than 250 mils where you actually start seeing free fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Um, it's not the best tool in obese patients. Um, it's not very good, like I said already, um, to get a diagnosis of intraperitoneal organs, like the liver, spleen, um, intestines. Um, you can't make good diagnosis there. You will not be able to evaluate the, the, the retroperitoneal area. This is one region which is pretty much missed in the whole examination, but you can exclude everything else, and then that's normally the region which is the one which is left over, the retroperitoneal region. Um, if you're not very well trained, you're more likely to get a false positive exam. Um, I forgot to say, in the left upper quadrant, there's also a, a, the, the stomach can actually, if there's a lot of fluid inside the stomach that can reach towards the window you look at, and then you um, maybe false positively find this is a free fluid, but it's actually only a stomach full of, um, for example, beer or wine or whatever, especially in trauma patients. Um, yeah. What these are actually my last points for you to take home. First of all, practice as much as you can uh, wherever you are, on the ward, in the emergency department, on ITU. Try to get the ultrasound machine, play around. Sometimes people, or the, the doctors, may be not very likely to let you know, but if you promise them not to destroy the machine, they will let have you, uh, have you let it go. Know the limitations, so you have to go um, through the literature. Um, or fomate or whatever you want to do, but know the limitations of the examination. It's not the golden egg. Um, you have to use it in conjunction with all the other techniques to, to figure out what's going on, but most important, have fun with it, and I guess this setting here is probably the best, best place to start learning it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot for your talk. And um, like for the other talks, are there any questions? Um, any questions on the video conference? Um, anyone? Ah, okay. Well, I, I will read it to you. Uh, there's a few questions from Berlin. What are the pitfalls when performing fast as a student amateur with less experience? Well, I think um, I already talked 
through quite a lot of the um, pitfalls you can have with the fast exam. It does not necessarily mean you have to be a beginner in this. It's just by using the ultrasound more and more, you will understand what could cause the, the troubles with or what, what the, the, the pitfalls potentially are. Um, like I said, don't misinterpret um, vessels or normal structures like the gallbladder, um, stomach, um, or maybe a cyst on the, on the, on the spleen as, a, as a, f a positive examination. If you scan up and down, it is normally a contained round structure that's less likely to be free fluid in the abdomen. Um, otherwise, yeah, I guess it is the, the only thing I can suggest, train as much as you can. Um, initially, you will think how will I be able to identify in a positive fast exam, but the more normal situations you see, normal non-positive fast exams, it will become quite obvious. Um, and don't be afraid of using it. Like I said, if a patient is shocked and there's a lot of free fluid in the abdomen, you are very, very likely, even if, an un if you're an unexperienced um, user, that you will find the free fluid. Okay, thank you. I think there was a second question there. If I remember it right, it was just there for a few seconds. It was, what probe would you use for fast? Um, like Is it like the convex or the face ray probe? Um, but you, you can use both. Okay. But if I wouldn't want to choose one and want to do one exam with, uh, wouldn't want to do the whole exam with one probe, I would probably go for the convex um, curved linear probe rather than the, the face array. Um, if you want to use um, the cardiac abilities of the face array as well, if you want to do some more cardiac exams, then I probably would go for the face array right away with the limitation that the pneumothorax is much harder to, uh, to identify. Well, perfect, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Any other universities? Okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. We've got yeah. a little greeting <laughs> for you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, a few things, thanks for coming here yeah. from, from, from Great Britain. That's <laughs> quite <laughs> a way. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.